Hi everyone and welcome to the third in our series of webinars with Women Transformers, All Ireland Chats. The, the unique thing about these webinars is that they involve women all over the island of Ireland talking about things that are important to their enterprise, their organisations, their business, whether they be female founders. And today we have some incredible social entrepreneurs to talk to you about changes that have happened during the pandemic. And I'm going to be doing that lovely job of diving deep into their mindset to find out how they did it and what we can learn from it. But before I do, uh, please welcome Roseanne Kelly from Women in Business in Northern Ireland, the woman who puts it all together. Welcome, Roseanne. Thanks, Nora. And uh, good morning, everyone. And you are so welcome here today to this uh, webinar. As Nora said, it's the third in our series um, that uh, of our All Ireland Chats. Um, and hosted by our fabulous Nora and kindly sponsored by Intertrade Ireland. And as Nora said, this one is around social enterprise. So we have three fabulous women here this morning uh, to talk to you. So um, I just want to thank them in advance for sharing their stories, but also for, for their time. So we have Alva Lakeen from Izzy Wales, Maeve Monaghan from the Now Group and Marie Mackle from Taris's Enterprises um, and a board member of, of Women in Business as well. Um, so thank you guys in advance uh, for your time. Uh, and before I, I hand back over to Nora, I just need to remind you all that we have an All-Ireland Female Entrepreneur Conference coming up um, on the 10th and the 11th of June. Uh, we have fabulous uh, range of speakers, including Mary Portis, um, and we also will have networking on an All-Ireland basis. So um, go on to the Women in Business website and book today. So that's me, Nora, and uh, good luck, everyone, and thank you again. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much, uh, Roseanne. I think when we were trying to design this series of webinars, the one thing that I was conscious of when I'm mentoring women, whether they're female founders or women in corporate life or in social enterprise, the one thing that people found very difficult was to understand how much they could change uh, to correspond with the changing world that was going on around them. And some women did that phenomenally well. They had a startup mentality and perhaps the wisdom of uh, experience. So they understood that maybe waiting around for the world to change wasn't the necessarily the best option that maybe it's them themselves that needed to change. For some, it was, you know, the answer is digital. What's the question? Because obviously in online retail and in lots of other spaces, digital was the answer. And some of those businesses managed to, I think they did a trajectory of like 10 years of digital development in the space of less than a year, which was phenomenal. So here we are sitting, fingers crossed, like those of you joining from the Republic of Ireland will notice the hairdos from the North of Ireland are always much better than ours. I just managed to squeeze Mayan in. We just got it uh, this week and I'm just very envious that in a very short period of time they're going to be dining indoors and we're still waiting to dine outdoors. Nonetheless, there is a kind of a feeling of hope in the air. I think people at the moment feel like, you know, they can see the vaccines are being rolled out a little bit faster here in the Republic, doing phenomenally well in Northern Ireland, obviously. But there is a, a feeling that some normality may be coming back into our lives. So it's a great time to be doing this. And also it's a great topic because the one thing I found during the pandemic is that, for want of a better word, people discovered their inner social soul. Um, so maybe in the past they were busy doing things. And then, you know, I know charities, some charities have done phenomenally well down here. The Late Late Show has highlighted a number of very important charities. Pieta House, I did Darkness into Light in that terrible weather last weekend, but, you know, raised a phenomenal amount of money. And I think people have understood going back sometimes to organic, understanding a little bit about climate change, um, being respectful of, of our environment, of nature, spending time on themselves. So this is a great time to talk about. So I, I would say that all of the young people that I mentor, their interest is not in commercial enterprise, it's in social enterprise. So it's a really important topic to do. So without further uh, ado, I'm going to go straight into asking questions. Maeve, you're straight up. It's just the way you look on screen. So um, can I ask you first, when the pandemic happened, what happened to your enterprises? You have multiple enterprises. Yeah, so I suppose the multiple part was a, was a challenge. We support over a thousand people with learning difficulties in autism. So right away, we had to make a plan about how we, you know, close down our services, support those individuals to um, be at home. And, and that's not that easy for all, any of us, but it's more difficult when you've got um, learning difficulties and autism. But we also have six cafes and the sales just stopped. 
it was a really, really big shock. So cash was a challenge right away. Logistics in relation to supporting vulnerable people to understand what was happening when nobody really knew what was happening. And then I suppose the other part about that mixture of staff having to learn how to work from home and then a number of other staff needing to be furloughed from the businesses. So yeah, plenty went on very quickly, Nora. Very tough. I know that people who had to furlough staff found that one of the most difficult things to do. Um, and, and what about you yourself, Maeve? You know, um, I think everybody listening in understands that we're all blended humans. We don't come ready made as our business brains and our leadership roles. What happened to you? Yeah, so to be honest, when I was thinking about this session, I think I'm still processing what happened to me because I think there was waves of panic and waves of calm and, and that feeling of thinking you had things sorted and then they weren't has been something that I think I'm still reflecting on. But, you know, I, I went to working from home. So as an extrovert and somebody who does a lot of business development, works from cafes, loves meeting people, loves seeing the next opportunity. Maria and I have met many, many times in cafes. That all went and I was at home and, and, and we were all at home and it was, it did feel very oppressive um, and certainly a panic as well because with three kids under 11 doing the homeschool school in peace, trying to manage the organisation remotely and not getting out of the house. I, I think there was a, just a real challenge, challenge of how do you do that in a way that's effective in any of the jobs? <laughs> so it would have been really, a really good plan to have a no real plan. And I, I often think of my husband who works from home and was quite happy for years at the bottom of the garden. And then he had all of us as well <laughs> on top of him. So all of those relationships changed. And I think we probably just had to learn how to do it and understand that it, it, that nobody knew what we were doing really at the beginning, to be honest. But, you know, that 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 challenge of those different, per the, the different jobs you have all coming into one place is yeah. probably the thing I remember most. I can, uh, that resonates with me hugely. And Mairead, um, well, Maeve was saying, you know, you're, you're out and about yourself a lot, but your organisation probably went through one of the most fundamental changes when the pandemic hit. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here with you, Nora, and talk about all this because it's a very important topic. But I suppose my organisation is slightly different to Taurus's enterprises. It's like a mix of commercial entities and not-for-profits. So we operate four core divisions, which are healthcare, housing, wellbeing, and then a not-for-profit not section. So each of our divisions, though, have that common thread of, you know, tackling social issues and having social impact. And our organisation employs 1,200 people across the island of Ireland. So you can imagine when the pandemic hit, like overnight, our, all of our staff became essential workers. And I suppose each division had its critical role to play. And it was really uncertain times. Uh, you know, there was a lot of fear and confusion and limited knowledge globally because we were really trying to remain calm. But what we had to do really was just think logically, open up lines of communication and just provide guidance for people because like we were just, nobody really knew the answer. So we just had to, to do that. And I suppose to give you a quick idea, you know, within our healthcare division, we provide 5,000 calls every day out in the community. So the important thing for that was dealing with vulnerable people was really to, you know, keep that service going and to keep our, our clients and our staff safe. And then within housing, we provide like three and a half thousand beds every single night. And like overnight, we had to develop a 24 seven referral system because there was a, an urgent need to like improve housing and people needed to get into homes. And then in terms of the wellbeing section, the key thing there was really, again, keeping people safe. We had to source PPE. There was a global shortage. So we had to put a team together really dedicated just to, you know, getting that all sorted. And then, then on the not-for-profit side, again, it was another really important thing because the eye care charity that we have was set up 10 years ago, and it's really based on acts of kindness and providing kindness and things within the community, and that can be really anything. But we were unable to do any of the normal fundraiser things, so we had to start thinking really creatively. And so what we decided to do, we looked at all the people we had out in the front line. We seen that people had desperate needs, you know, and people were isolated. So the best thing we decided to do was to bring food and essential supplies to people who are isolated. So we got our team all in place and that. And I think as well, people at the start were feeling very helpless and, you know, people who weren't in work. And the pandemic sort of came out of nowhere, changed everything, challenged the way we think. And it was a huge effort, but I think everybody wanted to come and play their part and do something. So I think iCare was a great vehicle for that so that anybody could come along and do a bit. But for me, it was all about like research. It was all about learning, communication between me and the senior team. And it certainly developed, it needed, you know, would you talk about, Nora, the agile mindset? Because <laughs> um, 
there was a lot of strategic thinking, like quick decision making. But I think because we had that built that really good team over the last number of years and have a really strong core purpose, then that really mean everybody really stepped up to the mark. So I was very proud of everybody. Yeah, and I think that agile mindset, um, I know you, Marie, quite well, so I know your brain is always agile and you're always thinking, like, I, I think innovation is like a state of mind for you. You just always walk in every day thinking, what can I do that's different? What can I do that's better? But it's not as if home life was quiet. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about you and what happened when the pandemic hit. You want the truth? Yes, the truth. <laughs> I suppose and, and, and chaotic is the only way I could describe the home life because immediately we all had to, you know, work from home. I am a mother of seven, as you know, and three of them are in primary school. I had one at university. So the whole thing was turned upside down. And, um, you know, this constant talk. I mean, I, one of the things that I was really concerned about with the kids, their routines was all messed up. But also we had to be really mindful because this constant talk of the pandemic was really scaring them because they, did, they yeah. didn't really know that either, apart from being away from their routines. And I think it took an awful lot of resilience. It was a good word to describe how we got through it. Like our dining room turned into like the office. Every conversation was focused on research and what do we do and strategy because we had to lead our, our team at the end of the day. We just had to work. So the first six weeks, I think, was just a complete blur when I look back on it. And uh, then, but I think, you know, as time went by, we did find balance and we were able to separate home and life again. And I think we, we're a very big, close family and the, the older children are very involved with the business as well. So we all work together. Now, that did have us challenges, obviously, because we weren't used to working together. But over time, we, we found we got more family focus. We went for walks, which was a really good thing because the weather was amazing and that really helped. So we got back into our movie nights. And the whole experience, I think, on reflection, you know, it brought our whole family closer together. And, you know, I could think of nothing worse at the time. I was thinking, you know, this is all complete change, working from home, you know, forced on, it was forced on so many people. But I think on, you know, being open minded and say on reflection, I think that it was one of the most important transitions in my life that I have ever made. And it couldn't have come at a better time for me and my family. And I, I wouldn't change that now. It's amazing that you say that. Like, I, I, I often think of you, uh, Mairead, when people were talking about learning how to make sourdough bread. And it was like the whole country is divided into two groups of people, you know, people like you frantically busy and, you know, absolutely chasing your tail, trying to keep ahead of everything that was happening while also looking to the future. You know, um, it was always a tall order. Everyone used to say to me, well, you know, when you're talking to your female founders, you need to be telling them they need to be thinking strategically and up on the mountain and looking to the future. I said, most of them are just trying to survive. You know, it's not the time for brains to be full of creative instincts you know so uh, well done for surviving Alva um, firstly it's lovely to see you but uh, tell us a little bit about what happened to Izzy's wheels when the pandemic struck yeah so I guess our business is a bit different in that we actually make a physical product and something that happened to us like overnight was our manufacturing our manufacturing halted wow. and all of our wheel covers are made to order And that's something that we were really conscious of from the beginning because we wanted to make a business that was sustainable. So we wanted no waste. So that's great until there's a pandemic and your manufacturers close because that means business like literally ground to a halt. And it was really scary at the beginning because we didn't know what was going to happen. And um, our studio, so we have a lovely little, had a lovely little studio in uh, Dublin and that closed as well. So I went from being really busy to suddenly working from home and um, well, we just made do and the manufacturers opened again and just worked on a skeleton staff. So we could still produce our wheel covers but things were much slower. But something that was really amazing was how our community really got behind us and we just were really honest from the beginning and if someone had placed an order we just reach out to them and say like this isn't going to arrive next week and um, but bear with us and not a single person asked for a refund everybody was so supportive and um, which is really great um, and yeah I guess um, Alva just for people yeah. who are listening in like I I know 
that the pandemic hit soon after your big Barbie doll and Hello Kitty design collab uh, collaboration. And for people who don't know, you know, Alva and her sister Izzy were named as Forbes 30 under 30, one of Forbes 30 under 30, um, have an Instagram following in the stratosphere of zillions. Um, and I've collaborated with multiple high end designers all over the world to create those very vibrant and beautiful Izzy's wheel covers. So the designers stuck with you, Alva? The designers stuck with us, everyone stuck with us, like the Hello Kitty collaboration was due to come out right after the pandemic hit and like we are a design led company, everything is super visual and that's wonderful when even photo studios are open and yeah. like I'm based in Dublin and Izzy's in Galway and normally she's up and down to me once a week but like she was very vulnerable. So she couldn't take any risks. So she had to cocoon. So we weren't even together. So we had to run the business from opposite sides of the country. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a lot of learning. Um, but even like say Hello Kitty were super understanding and they worked with us because the thing was, every business was going through something shocking and everyone was just trying to stay afloat. And um, so, uh, and we have other like artist collections coming out as well. Like we work with amazing artists from all around the world and we just had to like think creatively. Like we weren't going to be able to shoot in photography studios with teams anymore. We had to get back to basics. So yeah. um, I decided to move back to Galway with Izzy and had my camera, we used all of our own clothes and we just did our photo shoot in our back garden. And you know what? It was actually so lovely. Um, and like our mum was really into gardening and it was totally different than anything we would have done before. Um, and this was very authentic and like, our community loved it. So it actually ended up being really nice and we just made do with what we had around us. So I, I just... Know. When I listen to you, Alva, I feel like these waves of positivity washing all over me. You're just always so upbeat. But tell me a little bit about you. You just mentioned a glimpse of, you know, obviously you weren't seeing Izzy so much. And I think yeah. now you're her primary carer. But um, at the start of the pandemic, describe just describe a little bit about you. What happened to you personally? So I was living in the middle of Dublin and my office is around the corner like everything was great we had a calendar that was booked back to back for like a year and a half we were going around to fashion weeks around the world talking about wheelchair fashion working with amazing designers and everything was just going perfectly and then <laughs> this hit and it just turned everything upside down and I had just moved apartment and now suddenly I was working from home and my boyfriend is working from home as well and I basically had to turn our apartment into a wheel cover factory and every surface was now <laughs> wheel covers and boxes and ribbons and all sorts of like rainbow stuff and um, so that was intense um, but you know we just may do and um, I guess the biggest thing at the beginning was that I couldn't see Izzy and you know she's my co-founder and you know, like I produce these really colorful wheel covers for wheelchairs, but I myself am into wheelchair user. Izzy's my sister and she's my model and our brand ambassador. And I couldn't produce any content because we weren't together. So um, I made the decision after a few weeks that it was gonna come back to Galway and be with Izzy. And it was the best decision that I ever made. Um, and so I moved back in with mom and dad down here and We've actually had a really nice time and because <laughs> I never thought that in my late 20s I'd ever be back at home again. Like I moved out of home over 10 years ago and then I came back and it was lovely um, and we just worked them down here and um, we now have, we, we launched Hello Kitty which was our, probably our biggest collaboration yet with you know a huge Japanese company in the middle of a lockdown and we have another really big collaboration coming out in three weeks that we've been Ooh. working on um this entire year as well so you're keeping that secret i can tell alva well yeah. you're not the only person in their late 20s living with mom and dad i can assure you <laughs> <laughs> Ma thanks alva Maeve, can we go back to you and let's talk a little bit about change because um most of this webinar is about change and transforming so tell us a little bit about you know, your own organization, you described, you know, this kind of cataclysmic, you know, boulder that hit everything and all of the things you had to deal with. So when you did decide that you needed to change things, was it a slow realization or a eureka moment? 
Yeah, so I, I still I still think of that analogy of the waves because I think we had a plan and then we thought, well, it's bad, but the, we'll sort that. And then it got worse and then we sorted that and then it got worse and we think, well, no, nothing else could happen. And they open for a while and close for a while. And so, uh, you know, I, I think there was a gradual piece in it, but what we were really, really sure about was that the, the, the fabric of our organization is about innovation and grit. And, and we employ people for those reasons. They're, they're, they're the values, they're some of the values in the organization. So we, we looked at what we had and what we could do. And certainly in the catering field where we had an order book going for a year, we were on an absolute growth trajectory around corporate catering, we're taking on new sites. All of a sudden that went overnight. I, I can even remember that week where that order book just dropped off. Yeah. And, and then we started to think, well, that isn't coming back anytime soon. And there was a, a there's a mourning and a loss around that because the shock is so deep. <laughs> um, but then we started to look at well, what can we do? So the catering business is a really good example. Love catering is a really good example of where we flipped and we looked at pivot around it. So we weren't going to have that corporate catering business. Five of the sites were closed. We had our own site on the Grosvenor Road that we wanted to remain open. And we went straight to providing food packs for frontline workers. We got a contract in relation to that. The team absolutely flipped. Everybody was involved from all different parts of the organization and making sandwiches and packing things up and looking at PPE and trying to get processes right and looking at. So th there was a coming together at that time, Nora, that was really good. And, and uh, you know, I think, is it, uh, I think some of the, one of the things I think that happened when it was, we nearly built a, a community around us. So people, because we were still operating and we were telling that story around what, what we were trying to do, people really came um, behind us online. So along with that, we started um, catering into people's homes. So we would have had the ready meals. We, yeah. looked, we did a lot of um, cookery packs for, we, we sort of were um, 70 families, vulnerable families, where the mum or dad has a learned difficulty or autism. They didn't know how to cook. They, they, and anything they were cooking wasn't that healthy so we were having to start to look at educating that so that 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 took that um, business really flipped and we were able to bring it a revenue in again and as part of that love catering we had a small element of a pottery in one of our sites and we scaled that quite quickly and that probably has been one of the biggest innovations there about changing, you know, to an online business. And Maeve, can I just ask, a bit like Parade, you work across so many different multiple levels, like the agility of that brain is, is incredible. But when you were making those changes and coming up with those ideas, was it all in your own head? Where did you get your support from? You know, did you have a mentor? Well, no, yeah, well, I, I think, you know, even before it was cool to have a mentor, I've always had somebody who knew something I didn't and I've never ever been, um, and I've never been afraid of admitting I don't know and, and wanting to be surrounded with people with really amazing brains. So, yes, I, I now have a mentor and I'm involved in a, in a leadership network. So we kind of look to each other on that. Yeah. But you know, I think the real strength, Nora, was in the executive team we have in the organization and, and recruiting for grit definitely came good then. You know, the, 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 my other two, I have Dan and, and Pauline, who are um, you know, part of the executive team. We nearly had a war room for a while. <laughs> We're just it's, in that exactly. Room, yeah. Planning things out, you know admitting that we didn't know just like Maria said that that dinner table type of um yeah. conversation that happens starting to plan that out and, and admitting that we were panicked and and working out what we could do and I think that probably is if I look back that'll be the thing I remember most which there's, is great there's a strength forge there that is an absolute foundation for future organizational development and the one thing I'd say, Maeve, is that all of us, uh, you know, know people who know far more than we do, but not all of us recognise that sometimes, which I, is I great. Think diverse, diverse brains, Nora, that, yeah. I, you know, the, the diversity just makes, brings innovation, definitely. Yeah. Thanks, Maeve. Um, Mairead, what about you in terms of change? I mean, obviously your organisation, whether you liked it or not, was going through all of your organisation's multiple changes, but you yourself transforming um, the businesses and the social enterprises. Well, I'm loving uh, Maeve's analogy to a war, war, war room. 
Um, and I suppose overnight we realized we needed to change, you know, because there was so, there was, so, you know, so many facets to consider. Uh, so we put it, to, so the first thing we did was really put together a dedicated time to really focus on each facet and all the changes that we needed to make. And thankfully we had invested a good bit over the last number of years in digital solutions, you know, and paperless systems mm. within our, our organization which meant that, you know, the, the, we, a lot of our work was done electronically and submitted in real time. So that was all done. But we needed to move really quickly in other areas if we hadn't moved as fast on, for example, like training, because training is a big part of, you can imagine, of our organization. Yeah. And sh- traditionally, that would have been all done face to face. So we had to really explore new training methods. So we started using like online modules, you know, Zoom classes, and then even videos to explore like practical te- techniques like lifting and handle that all had to be considered. And the other thing that was really important for us as an organization was communication because we are spread out so much and across Ireland. So it's really critical. So we had invested again in an internet a few years ago so that people could access policies and procedures and all. But everything was changing so much over the last year. So we had to make sure that they had immediate access and updates straight away. You know, so we were able to use that system then to, you know, daily send updates of reassurance and provide guidance and everything to staff. So that worked quite well. I think the biggest change for us over the past year was in our housing team because this massive increase in demand just happened overnight. So and we hadn't moved them over totally to digital systems. So how to move that really quickly. We also had a lot of structural changes to do, if you can imagine. So we needed to recruit new staff. We needed to get new storage and new offices and all new equipment. So that took a lot of, um, you know, again, decision making and demands. But I think all the changes that were made, were, they were forced upon us. You know, we had it, it has all been really positive because it's just expedited the processes. And I think they're definitely here to stay. And I think that one of the key things for us is the flat management and owner structure here, because we were able to make those decisions ourselves really quickly. We didn't have to ask anybody permission. We just all got our heads together with the senior team and just, you know, made whatever the decisions had to be made, but we did feel an immense responsibility to make sure that we got it right because so many people were dependent that we did. Yeah, Yeah, that that's the thing about your both of your line of work, you know, as in when you make decisions, they're actually pretty huge in terms of the human uh, impact. And Mairead, like when you describe your house, you know, obviously your husband's an incredibly busy man. You've got the seven children, some older, some younger. So there's different levels of support there. Where did you get your support like who helped you to make those final decisions well as i said before we're a very close family and uh, you know we're, we're very much we talk about all the decisions together and um, my husband's a great support and we have a great like um great team in the office and they've been with us for years so like we're, we're all very close knit in our decision making we just sort of put our heads together with every decision and, and you know trash out the pros and cons um, and the older ones were really good as well. My eldest daughter's a doctor, so she really helped us with, you know, the research and all that sort of stuff. So that was a really big asset to us. And I think just I'm like me, if I'd be part of a lot of different networks, so you just reach out and help people. And I think yeah. it's really important that you're learning every day, like every, like it's a lifelong learning, learning process. So you're learning from people. I love hearing stories from people and learning how they've done things. And then from that, you can, you know, like learn yourself on how to do things better. Yeah, which is true. Well, Mairead and I belong to an awful lot of similar networks. So um, I know we do a lot of uh, peer to peer support with one another, which is which is really useful. Um, Alva, how about you? So uh, obviously you've described the changes that happened within Izzy Sweels and um, then, uh, you know, you decided that things had to change. You weren't going to sit around waiting for photo studios to open up again. Um, so tell us a little bit about that as to whether, you know, did you just wake up one day and say, okay, I know Izzy exactly what we need to be doing? Um, or were you just chatting through it? Well, I guess for us, things needed to change straight away. We had to really think about our messaging was the biggest one. So um, we were lucky in that we were already completely digital business. Like what we do is very niche, but in a digital space it makes total sense because you can sell all over the world. Um, so luckily we had that well set up. Um, but it also it means that we do all of our advertising online. Like our social media is how we promote our products and it suddenly didn't feel right trying to get people to buy things. Like we, um, like our community or wheelchair users and a lot of them would have health complications and yeah. were very scared during 
the pandemic and understandably so and it didn't feel right trying to sell people things and launch new collections and that's not what we're about like we are a business but more much more than that you know we try and bring happiness to wheelchair users and positivity and color and we just had to figure out the right way to continue doing what we're doing and bringing happiness to people and when we were kind of like oh my god like how are we going to create content like we can't do photo shoots and stuff people are always writing to us saying they love looking at our instagram page and it just makes people really happy so we just thought now more than ever people need that color they need that happiness and we focus on doing that um, and that was really fun and um, we just made sure that our content was really wholesome and it made people feel good and we got people involved as much as possible so our spokespeople who are our users who wear our wheel covers and we also had this extra time that we would have spent going to events and speaking at events and we tried to use that time wisely and we started doing some talks in schools and stuff and doing art classes so we do these easy wheels workshops where uh, children can design their own wheel covers and you know put their favorite things on them and it just gets kids thinking about about disability and about medical uh, wheelchairs not just being a medical device that they can actually be something really beautiful um and all around that inclusion so we basically just decided we need to use our time and you know our skills to make people happy right now and to distract them from all the badness that's going on and just bring a bit of joy to people's lives so and Alva you know when you when you talk you speak so much sense and you know I can see that people listening in can hear that in you that for a young person you've got all this depth to your knowledge and instinctive and empathy um but who supports you like I think you are an incredible support to so many people but do you have a mentor or who do you turn to that's really nice thank you um well I guess Izzy is my biggest inspiration and she's super supportive and like what we do in Izzy Wheels like we've very different kind of roles within it like I focus on the business side and you know working with the artists but Izzy is the voice behind the brand and the reason why I feel so inspired to do it every day um but I'm also really lucky to be part of other women's networks as well and that's something that's so so important at the moment because yeah you know, it's, it can be really lonely being Sorry. like a business owner right now. And especially when like, you know, we were always in a co-working space and like me and Izzy loved that because we're real people, people. Um, and, you know, when that's kind of taken away from you, it is hard. So um, having other like women that you can, you know, have a weekly call with um, who are also going through the same stuff in business, even if their business is totally different, is so important. So that's been vital for us. Yeah, I can see that. Um, I often, you know, I'd like to ask you before we finish, if you ever fight with this, you just have the incredible relationship that sisters don't often have. <laughs> Maeve, can I jump over to you and just ask you a little bit about your behavioural change? So a lot of people, women in particular, um, have commented on the fact that their behaviours have changed. So what kind of things do you do now, I guess, that you didn't do before the pandemic? What, what's changed in your yeah. in your way of working? <laughs> I suppose overall I think it's that I don't sweat the small things anymore I, on reflection I think one of the things that we used to tend to do and I certainly was used to is getting quite annoyed about competition <laughs> seeing people copying you doing things or like and getting quite annoyed that they weren't going and finding something else to do that would have been useful or innovative as well and 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 and, and feeling not good about that it, Yes. And it had been an, a negative feeling back. And I think what what's happened with this pan, pandemic is we are certainly much more confident about who we are and what we do. And I am much more confident about the vision in peace. So I think we're less at the looking back and more at the looking forward. And I, that that's a that's a really, really big change. Um, and that helps us start to think about scaling an opportunity yeah. and development and stops us kind of micromanaging what's behind us and I think that's it that's the biggest thing and it feels good that Nora it yeah I think it, when when the pandemic happened I remember those early days you know I I like so many others were writing long missives about press pause and how for the first time in most of our adult lives 
we were able to stop and think. And, you know, I often wondered, did that lead to behavioural change? Did it give us the time to, you know, was it all really about going out and, you know, home cooking and listening to the birds or Mm -hmm. was part of it about this deep, deeper? So it's great to hear, you know, that you, I like the fact that you're looking to the future and visioning. But the opposite question then, I suppose, you know, what do you, what do you not do now? (laughs) You know, um, well, I, I think what I, I've had to look at as a leader of an organization for quite a while, I, I am a forward thinking person, but I would be more on the opportunity side than having the, the homework done and, and focusing on the foundations. So I, I think we do that forward piece, but we have a really, really strong, the, the lockdown really helped us build a strong foundation in the organization. And there's an absolute focus on, cash and communication being queen you know an example yeah. of that is you know in a, in a catering business that was really rocketing and we had lots of corporate catering clients we were so busy getting that business delivering it supporting our participants to be involved in that we had a lot of debt sitting out there that we weren't really bringing in because we were so busy creating more income so we we have a balance now in that and, and when lockdown happened initially it was all hands on deck get the cash in right from our chairperson myself the whole support services team everybody had a job their names people were very good at paying to be fair yeah. we got it in really quickly but that that focus on yes it's great to have the forward planning piece but I need to have the house in order as well. So I don't know if that says something I'm not doing, but it's probably something Yeah, I it do. does. I think uh, maybe you said something really interesting, which I often struggle when I'm talking to people who are social entrepreneurs or people who are working more in the volunteer charity sector. Uh, they see money as a dirty word. And I'm always saying to them, firstly, you know, cash is king or queen, uh, because if you don't have it, you can't do a lot. And I would say the, the highest level of burnout and stress I see is where people have a, a passion for or a desire to change something but don't have the same passion for the money side of it you know and they get frustrated they don't have the money to do what they want to do but yeah, you obviously know that no well my what I say to people is you know I'm an entrepreneur I love making money it's just yeah. what we do with it that's different yes yeah 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 exactly yeah uh, Marie, the same question to you I suppose what are you what are you doing now that you didn't do before well um I suppose it's um, in terms of, I suppose I've always been very solutions driven um, and, and I, I, see, I suppose when we watched the organisation, what they did, you know, and how they got through the pandemic, um, I did press pause and take a wee bit of time then and thought I'd look to the future and take some time out to, I suppose, look at strategy and reassess where we're going as an organisation. Now, I know that... Um, you know, the, the, the common underlying theme is that we want to use business for good and that's never going to go away. But in terms of, you know, we have the commercial enterprises, which then helps to fund the social enterprises. But I looked at all of our moving parts because we have so many moving parts during that time. And they fell under those four divisions, which is healthcare, housing, and then the well-being and the not-for-profit section. So we really uh, said, well, we're going to bring it all under one umbrella. So we uh, come up with Taris's Enterprises, which is our um, umbrella company now and, and put our four divisions under that. So that was a good in terms of strategic thinking and, and where we were going as an organization. We also started to look at our structure and our growth and we set up an advisory board for the first time. We've never had one of those. So that's been amazing. And we created what we call Vision 2025. So, And Marie, can I just ask you, so so what you're describing, I'm, I'm trying to get underneath that a little bit. So you're describing things structurally, but actually in your head, you were obviously thinking quite differently. Well, I suppose we've had so, uh, I mean, we have in, in, in so many different moving parts and I always wanted to take time out to say, where does this all fit? And like, you know, I, I think, you know, I told you before about the trip I'd had to India in 2011 and that just so, totally changed my mindset in business and corporate social responsibility. So I'm very passionate about using business for good. So I wanted to make sure that Yes, you have to make money to run, I mean, your commercial enterprise, but it's what you do with that. And that's, you know, where we go for that for profits. But I suppose I I wanted to create Vision 2025 to give, because it's it's a leader's job to share their vision, because sometimes it's all in your head and people don't know where you're going. So, I mean, I thought that was important for me to take time out and say, all right, well, this is where we're going. 
So, you know, our Vision 25, like we, we thought about, you know, what our strengths are and there are passion for what we do. There are people, committed people. We have an approach to innovation because as you say, we have an innovative mindset. We're always exploring new ideas. We're looking at new discoveries. You know, the answer is yes. Now, what is the question? I also like, we will explore all these things. So our new Taurus's motto was actually creating innovative solutions for the future of living. So we have lots of like exciting new projects as I've discussed with you before. We have portable yeah. accommodation, we have investment in housing, we have renewable energies, we're looking at retirement villages, just different things that we feel that's gonna be really important for the future of living of people. And then as well as that, we set up a wellbeing clinic. That was one of the things we did that we didn't do before because we'd done a lot of research into um, you know, what was needed and uh, I suppose like um, we felt that well-being is going to be a really big focus going forward. So the well-being centre really was developed from all the research was done over the last 18 months. And um, I think mental, physical, nutrition, all those sort of fitness, all that thing's going to come to the fore now. So we've really, you know, we'll be telling our grandchildren about this pandemic that we went through. And I think a lot of good will come from it and it will give us a better focus on the priorities in life and balance and health. So I've set up a, we set up a clinical team about a year ago and they have developed biometric testing and it's really to offer peace of mind to people. So we look at cardiac risk, things like blood sugar levels, just because they're important to me, like IV therapies. I'm doing yeah. functional medicine. So we just, we, we just, I just think, I do believe that the future of work is going to look differently for everybody. And, you know, we're looking at all those sort of so. And lots of, and that's really good, you know, that you're thinking more strategically, but not just about things within your own organization, but the whole of society. Um, Alva, I think uh, Marade said there about, you know, t the grandchildren, you know, talking about the pandemic and a moment in time. But maybe not. Maybe maybe there'll be more pandemics in their lifetime. I don't know. But you yourself, have you noticed a change in how you behave or the things that you do or sweaty the small stuff, as Maeve has said? Yeah, I guess we kind of, it gave us an opportunity to look at the business as a whole. Like for people that don't know, Izzy Wheels started off as my college project. Yeah. And so I launched this business when I was 22 and I had no business experience before. And this just overnight, we had a video that went viral and it got 3 million views in a day and 16 million views in a week. So we had to grow our business really, really quickly. And it just kind of, um, yeah, everything was like super fast and um, I was learning as I went along and it has been like rapid all the time. So when this all happened, it really gave us an opportunity to look at the business and all the different aspects of the business that had been overlooked and stuff that had just been in place since the very beginning. So even down to all the different suppliers. So we have, we've been using the same supplier in Dublin all the time. And we love them. We're going to stay totally loyal to them. And like everything to do with the wheel cover is produced in Ireland. So we needed backup suppliers in all the different aspects, including all the packaging, the boxes, the bubble wrap, you like you name it. So because it gave us a fright when the manufacturers, you know, came to a halt and um, we needed to make sure that, you know, if anything does happen, if there is another pandemic, as you said, that, you know, you have backups, that you don't leave yourself stuck. So we were able to look at all the different parts and make sure that um, everything, what, well, yeah, that there was back supplies of everything. And um, so now every single part of our wheel cover and every part of the process is Irish, totally Irish made. Everything is sourced here, which we're really proud of. Yeah. Um, and great. Uh, yeah, I guess like even looking at like the actual logistics of the business, cash flow, planning, all that kind of stuff, like it gave us a time to properly plan. And that's something that like I think people took for granted. Um, and looking at the business in where do we see ourselves in five years time, like everything was moving so fast before that, that we didn't, I guess, get to do that properly and uh, because everything was changing all the time. So now we have a roadmap for new products. So not just wheel covers, we plan on expanding our offering and that's been really exciting we've had the time to properly give to all those new products and um, so we just made the most of the time we had <laughs> I'm dying to know, Alva. We'll have to wait to find out a little bit more. So this is the quick fire round. Um, so what I really want you to do is to try for the people who are um, 
who are listening in, try to give those nuggets of wisdom that have guided you a little bit in your life, you know, to pass it on to them. Um, Alva, I particularly, you're going to be last, but I particularly want you to think about if you don't have an Izzy in your life to give you inspiration and you're a young person who has, um, as I said at the start, most young people want to make a difference to society. Um, you know, where where could they go to get that kind of inspiration or that authentic thought process that leads them to have a passion like you do but Maeve um good to start with you um advice for our listener inners yeah so I, I suppose it's kind of a combination of what we talked about before I, I think spend time on vision you've heard it from the other two speakers yeah. as well get the vision and set it out write it down and tell the story because as Maria had mentioned as well entrepreneurs have it in their head, you've got it across all businesses, nobody understands what you're thinking if you don't tell the story. I, I, I would say that people, we should all do one day, one thing a day that scares you. It's a really good way to get up in the morning and think, what is it, what is it that scares me and I'm going to do it anyway. And that piece around surrounding yourself with people with diverse brains and that have expertise and opinions that aren't the same as yours, you know, operating and leading in a vacuum does not help anybody. Yeah, I, I love I've just written a feature on fear because it was such an important part of my development as a leader that if I didn't have and I took it to extremes, Maeve, you know, there was I coach people in public speaking and things which they're terrified of. And I can certainly identify with that. I was when I spoke first, you'd have that red rash down yeah. your neck and the lump in your throat and everything, you know. Um, but then I got addicted to that kind of dopamine rush so I would throw myself off planes and you know do the <laughs> high zip lining I was pulling the photographs together yesterday for the feature I was going did I really do that did I go racing on a racetrack you know <laughs> white water rafting you know <laughs> would I do it today but I totally agree with you brilliant advice thank you Marit what about you um well I suppose after all of this uh firstly I think that your health and your family are everything so yeah. everybody's realized that I think it's important for you uh, if you're starting a business or at any stage of your business to know what success looks like for you because it's really important. And as I always say, no, you'll, no one of us will ever lie on our deathbed wishing we'd spent more time in the office. So um, I think that you need to know and understand what your purpose is because and, stay, and, and if you stay focused on the bigger picture, like what, why you're doing what you're doing, I think that will help you when change happens because it inevitably will. And like with all the people I've spoken to, you know, with their Evolve Founder Series or people who've started business, I think they, they, they always reach out and trying to empower people. So I think you should always think about how you can empower others and even the smallest act of kindness will make a difference. And it's important as well to build trust with people. Trust is a really big thing uh, with your consumers. And like, because, you know, what we went through is it's our purpose really that has held us together. And our team now is really stronger than ever because of what we've been through. And I think, right, authenticity is something that, um, you know, you it screams off you, you know, it's just something that's so important to you because um, the one thing that I've always felt about, you know, people like Donald Trump, that they gave business people such a terrible name that somehow we left our morals at the door just because we wanted to try and go into business or become founders and run enterprises. But in fact, you know, all three of you and myself included, by the way, um, feel very powerfully that actually business and wealth growth is a means to something that could actually be transformative for society, which is which is exactly true. And being very authentic and true to yourself, um, which you are, Mairead. So Alva, the weight of the world on your shoulders now for the final nuggets of wisdom, please. <laughs> um, I guess, uh, like, I think it's really important to, as you say, be authentic. And that includes, like, trying to bring as many of what those things are that you love into your job and even if they're like unexpected ways and um, like say for me I never knew I was going to be a businesswoman I always saw myself as an artist um, and that's that's why I went to art college that's what I wanted to do but then I realized that every successful artist is also an amazing business person so you know it's really brilliant to be a creative um, business person like they really go hand in hand um, and I think something that people have really learned is from the whole lockdown people love things that are like locally sourced and sustainably made and that's something that like we've always made that effort to make sure that all of our products are made in Ireland but also you know we've now 
become known not just for the wheel covers but for the fashion that we wear and the clothes so we now only wear designers that are um sustainably made we don't shop fast fashion and we buy loads of our clothes on depop which is actually really fun and um, right. so that's all secondhand clothes and now what we do is we set up our own depop as well so um we can kind of swap our clothes as well and that's something that we also really love and it's like become a little hobby as well um and you know also like aiming high like believe in yourself like all the different collaborations that we've had with barbie who have actually got here and um, so this is a uh, wheelchair barbie and she's got a little matching outfit and her wheel covers and um, like that's a collaboration that was like such an amazing thing because we love barbie and we also loved hello kitty so like the reason i became a graphic designer was because i was so obsessed with hello kitty when i was younger and um, so i basically reached out to Hello Kitty and told them why well, they have to work with us um, and it actually happened so the collaboration we have coming out in um, three weeks is one that we have been dreaming of since day one like I have my notebook from college for and I wrote down like the like the collaboration I would absolutely dream of and that's actually happening now so to just go for it and like just believe in yourself and aim high because if you believe in yourself then other people will as well so um, that's my advice. Thanks, Alva. I, I, you know, just before lockdown, Alva and myself were involved in the Vital Voices Mentorship Walks. She came up to meet the president with Izzy. And, you know, the vibrancy that comes off both of them is just incredible. I do think that um, one of the most important things that you said there, I did an RT series with young women from the traveller community. And one of them was Leanne McDonough, who's a great friend of mine. And we've, you know, kind of been in and out of each other's lives for quite a while now. Um, and RT said, you know, Nora, you can't teach business skills to people who are artists. And I just laughed and said, you know what? A lot of people make a lot of money out of art and it's never the artist. So about time we started teaching them business skills so they could own their own copyright and negotiate properly over their work. So uh, in the same vein, I think business people could do with learning a little bit more about creativity. So fantastic to talk to the three of you. Um, what I loved about today is it was about social enterprise and all of you are very blended in the way you approach things. I think Alva started as a, a social enterprise that's now a commercial social enterprise which is exactly what all of them should be is part commercial and part social to all of you listening and thank you so much please go out on twitter and shout and roar and let people know a little bit more about what we're talking about as Roseanne says we have the first all ireland women breaking borders in ireland can i just say that you know we're about the only people who consistently in this webinar and in everything that we do talk about people all over ireland working together and trying to ensure that the whole of the island um, has a better future so go out on twitter and tell everyone the next webinar if i can give it a little plug and a little thing is going to come up at the end we have um Christine Boyle, but we have Moya Doherty of Riverdance and we have Anne Herity of CPL. So an incredible trio of women who are going to talk in our finale about uh, female founders and all of those great nuggets of wisdom that you just got today. Have a great Friday, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.